May 10, 2022, NHL draft lottery. I told you the Montreal Canadiens were going to get the first pick overall. It was written in the stars for so many reasons. Number one, the Canadians have suffered for way too long. Number two, the draft is going to be in Montreal. Number three, May 10 is a very lucky day for the Montreal Canadiens because on May 10, 1979, Guy Lafleur tied the game versus the Bruins in game seven and Yvonne Lambert went to win it. And I knew that number 10 would bring the Montreal Canadiens good luck. The late Guy Lafleur, who was born in 1951, was going to bring the Canadiens luck because maybe they're going to draft number 51, Shane Wright. I've been telling you all along, it's going to be all right. Now I bring in an expert who will tell us if Shane Wright is really the guy. If not, who is? It's all coming up with Simon, the snake, Boisvert, Quebec Major Junior Hockey League scout for four seasons and now a consultant with Les Farrars de Val d'Or. He joins me next on the Sick Podcast. Turn up your volume. Your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Tony Maradero. The Sickest Montreal Canadiens Podcast. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadiens win the Stanley Cup. Sports Entertainment like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. And Lacage. If the last time you went to Lacage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lacage. The menu will surprise you. Marinero, the sick podcast, and Sasa La Coupe. Yeah, maybe one day for the Montreal Canadiens, because guess what? They won the draft lottery, and they have the first pick in the 2022 NHL Amateur Draft. The sick podcast is brought to you by... 8.6 beer intense like me by nature like me the beer for those who follow their instinct and live their passion in order to make their mark and lacage if the last time you went to lacage was when the habs won the cup it's time you go back to lacage the menu will surprise you by the way the sick podcast is going back to lacage on saturday may 21st we are going to lacage de carry to celebrate the one year anniversary of the sick podcast RSVP, if you feel like going out that night, you feel like going out for supper, and you want to meet Tony Marinero and the sick team, we'll be at La Cage de Carry, RSVP at 731-2020. That's in the 514 area code. Pretty cool, huh? All right, okay. The Canadians won the draft lottery. We're going to talk about all the players who are draft eligible, and I bring in a man they call the snake. I have no idea why. I'll find out in a second. Simon Boisvert, how you doing, bud? I'm fine yourself, Tony. Very, very good. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. I have been following you for quite some time. You are the draft expert on 91.9 Spar, and I've seen you in the media here and there. I also saw you on social media, but I haven't seen you there for a couple of years. Where you been, Snake? I'm off Twitter. Oh, good for you. And I've never been on Facebook. Oh, no. So, you know, the only way you can hear me basically is on 91.9 and tonight with you guys. On the sick podcast. Yeah. What I hope will be the first of many. I hope so, too. Uh, we're going to increase your brand like it's never been increased before. I'm going to tell you that right now. All right. Okay. So it's the first time that you and I meet. This is uh, a virtual encounter here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you're called Snake. Why? It's because when I started writing on Mathias Brunet's blog in 2009, uh, I wanted to comment about something. It was kind of impulsive, and they wanted me to have a nickname. And I don't know why, but I thought of the nickname Snake 70. I'm not, okay. even, born in, I'm not even born in 1970. So don't ask me why. It's been 13 years. Okay. But I thought of the nickname Snake 70. All right. And, that, that's, that's and, pretty cool. And, and, and that's how people started calling me the snake. But I have to tell you, Simon Snake Boisvert, I like it. I like it too. I got used to it. All right. So four years scouting in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, now a consultant with Les Farrars de Val d'Or. Uh, when did you get into hockey? And how did you get into hockey? 
Okay, I'll, I'll try to make a long story short, but let's say I'm born in 66, and I started going to junior hockey on Friday nights with my dad in 1974. Just to give an idea, Mario Tremblay was playing his draft year. Okay. So that's been a while. Yeah. And very, very early, I was eight years old, and I was curious to see what, the players that I liked. I was curious to see how they were going to perform at the NHL level. And then I was able to start, that's how I was able to start scouting for fun. So I was always intrigued. So, you know, when Denis Savard was playing for the Montreal uh, Bleu Blanc Rouge, uh, there was the debate with Doug Wickenheiser the last time the Habs had the number one pick. And I had seen Wickenheiser on TV a couple of times because back in the day there weren't many junior games televised, but I had seen Savard in person every Friday night for three years. So I, I got into this and it went on and on and on. And in the late 80s, in my early 20s, I started writing letters to junior teams and NHL teams wanting to get into the scouting department. I, I, I don't think many of them responded to me. Maybe Jack Button, who was the GM for the Capitals at the time. Yeah. And Craig's dad. I, Craig's dad. Yeah, Craig's dad. Yeah. Yeah, And I had written to David Dombrowski also from the Expos, who was the okay. GM at the time. Okay. And I, 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 because I also wanted to get into baseball. It was either baseball or hockey. And he told me at the time, if you want to get into sports, take any job. You're not going to get into scouting at first. And me being a little bit, I wouldn't say impatient, but maybe thinking too highly of myself or I don't know what it is. But I said, look, I'm not going to go to Wichita, Kansas and serve hot dogs, hoping that one day I become a GM, which is basically what Alex Antopoulos did. And remember, at the time, it was... Alex Antopoulos, if memory serves me well, he was working in the mailroom for the... Yeah, mailroom, picking up players at the airport, basically basic jobs, and... Handing out the stat sheets to members of the media. But I never thought, in 1988, remember, it's 1988, I never thought that an internship like this could lead me to a scouting position. So I said, okay, forget it. Then about 10 years later, late 90s, I, uh, my neighbor in um, near uh, uh, Bromont, where I rented the chalet, he was a scout for Becomo, the Draca. And he was about to leave because he had three kids and he didn't have time anymore. So he said, I'll recommend you to my boss. I said, cool. Just before I had an interview, his boss, the GM, was fired. So opportunity missed, and then it went back to sleep again until 2009, when I started writing on Matthias Brunet's blog, and after a year, year and a half, he was intrigued. It, it, who is that snake guy? So we met, and he recommended me to Richard Liboron, who was the chief scout for Cape Breton uh, Eagles, and we got a 45-minute meeting, and he hired me on the spot. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So you become a regular on this podcast. You're going to end up being a GM in the National Hockey League within two years. I hope so. I hope so for you, too. I hope so for me, too, because then I have an in with you. Oh, All right, yeah, you okay. would. <laughs> so tell me uh, certain things that you look at when scouting a player. I mean, I mean, everyone knows the, the basics, of course, and you take a look at the skating and the ability and the stick handling and the shot and all that stuff. But how, what do you pay attention to maybe more so than anything else? What do you think are the characteristics that should be prioritized or that you prioritize? Well, obviously, hockey sense, skating, uh, the shot, everything you name is very important. However, what I'm trying to look for, first and foremost, is the qualities that a player has can they translate into the NHL? Like if the guy is, is dangling and he's zigzagging around players in junior hockey, will he be able to do this in the NHL? And if not, can he replace that skill with another NHL level skill that will work? Isn't that a very difficult question to answer considering that when the players are drafted, they're drafted at 17 years old, their body hasn't fully developed yet. Their brain hasn't fully developed yet. Their skills haven't fully developed yet. And they're probably going to develop fully in every aspect 
at age 22 or 23 or whatever it is. You correct me if I'm wrong. So isn't this something extremely hard to figure out? You know what? Uh, uh, it, when I started following the draft, players were drafted after the 19-year-old season instead of after their 17-year-old season. There were still mistakes being made. Because going back to the Habs in 1980... But less guy, mistakes, though, you would uh, think. Less mistakes. Uh, no, because look at a guy like Dog Wickenheiser. Yeah. Dog Wickenheiser, had he been drafted after his age 17 year, he would not have been a number one pick. But at, at age 18, he scored 89 goals. So a big centerman who scores 89 goals, he was kind of a no-brainer. But had the draft been done the year before, I think Denis Savard would have gone first. So I think, and look at football. The players come in at 22, 23. There's still tons of mistakes made because the college game is very different from the NFL game. The way uh, the junior game is different from the NHL game. And now what's becoming more and more complicated is that you used to be able to scout guys from the CHL, the Canadian Junior Hockey Leagues. So you could compare apples with apples. So you could compare Shane Wright with, I don't know, Matthew Savoy. But then... What do you do with these guys who play in these Russian junior leagues, Slovakian junior leagues? I mean, big skating, big ice uh, surface, no contact. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling, especially this year. All these prospects from everywhere around the world. How do you rank them? How do you judge them vis-a-vis -vis a North American player? You can uh, follow the Sick Podcast on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram at the Sick Podcast, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page. And by subscribing, you'll be notified when we go live with an episode or when an episode is uploaded. A shout out to uh, sportbuffshop.com for all your licensed sports apparel, including hoodies, caps, t shirts uh, of your favorite teams from all major leagues. Already, some Montreal Canadiens fans are ordering a Canadian jersey putting number 51 in the back, and the name is Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T for Shane Wright. We're going to find out if that's the guy that Simon Boisvert will pick in a couple of minutes' time. Uh, but also, uh, our sick merchandise is at sportbuffshop.com for as well. Use code SICK15 for 15% off on all of their items. I'm wearing Sassan La Coupe right now because uh, today almost feels like the Canadians beating Vegas in the semis last year and going to the Stanley Cup final. It's a very exciting day in Montreal, but it's a day that we, you know, a lot of us, you know, approach the day differently, Snake. Uh, some of us were anxious. Some of us were nervous. Um, some of us actually turned to God and, and to the, um, the power of prayer. I don't know if you had a chance to see this, but this was me earlier yeah. today. I know. I saw it. Marinero from the Sick Podcast, live at Maria Madre de Cristiani Church, along with Father Don Bosco. Father, today, May 10, is a big, big night for the National Hockey League and for the Montreal Canadiens because it's the NHL Draft Lottery. Tonight, the Montreal Canadiens will find out if they'll get the first pick in the draft, the second pick, or the third pick. And so I'm here today. I'd like to light a candle. And maybe if you can say a prayer, so we could put all the chances on the Montreal Canadian side for the number one pick overall in the draft. Do you think we could do that? The Lord will grant your desire. Do you suggest that we do the prayer first or I light the candle first? Well, you can light the candle and okay. we'll pray. Okay. okay, this is what we'll do since today is May 10 and with the passing of the great number 10, Guy Lafleur, to bring us good luck, I'd like to light the red candle, the 10th one, all right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. That one there. All right. Okay, so let's do that. There you go. Good. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your love, your blessing upon us, for creating us in your own image. You came to bring us joy, joy in different ways with your blessing, especially on this day as uh, the joy comes through sports. 
we ask your blessing uh, on this team uh, uh, who are going to really looking for their first pick and uh, as your uh, word says may you grant them their hearts desire that uh, they may really see and feel the joy in their life through your blessing and we ask this especially through the intercession of our blessed mother through christ our lord amen father it's going to be all right it's going to be all right you heard it from father don bosco it's going to be all right And there you have it, the power of prayer. And thanks very much to Father Don Bosco and Maria Madre de Cristiani Church for doing that. Is he something or is he something? Amazing. He has become the Montreal Canadiens good luck charm. I hope I am as well. All right, okay, so that was earlier on this afternoon. Fast forward to tonight. It was about 6.52 or 6.53 p.m. Bill Daly had gone through uh, pretty much the 16 teams Buffalo at 16, Vancouver 15, Winnipeg 14, the Islanders 13, Columbus 12, San Jose 11, Anaheim 10, Buffalo 9, Detroit 8, Ottawa 7, Columbus uh, 6, that pick was um, uh, from Chicago, Philadelphia 5, Seattle 4, and so there's three left, Montreal, New Jersey, and Arizona. Arizona with pick number three. So at that point, it's either Montreal or New Jersey. And Bill Daly flashes the card for the number one pick. Let's take a look at it. There you go. The Montreal Canadiens with the number one pick. And the New Jersey Devils get number two. Simon Boisvert, give me a scouting report on Shane Wright. Well, Shane Wright, I find, has moments where he looks like an NHL superstar. In his composure, the way he carries the puck, he has an elite, and I mean elite shot. So, And he'll make a spectacular play here and there. However, I don't find that overall he's a really electric or dynamic player. He's decent, Defensively, he can play on the PK in junior hockey. I think he's going to be a fine player. He's decent defensively. The, most scouts are saying he plays a 200-foot game and he reminds them of Patrice Bergeron. That's a little bit exaggerated. I think he is decent defensively. I don't see him as elite defensively. Um, the only thing elite about him is his shot. Uh, I don't find that he's necessarily uh, super strong on his skates. Like when there's puck battles in the corner, he lose balance. But obviously, he's only 17 years old. So to me, that's not really a concern for now. But my concern is that, and this is a concern with every player this year in the top five, is that I'm very, very, and I'm going to explain exactly, I'm very, very strong on value picks. Value picks being, will a guy outperform, outperform his selection slot, his draft slot? Shane Wright, to me, is not a value pick at number one. And neither is, let's say, Slavkovsky or Cooley or whatever at number two. I think the value starts in this draft around pick number six. So if Columbus calls me, and says, I'm I'll give you pick six and I'll give you pick 12 for your number one pick. You would do it right away. I call central registry and I say, let's make the trade before they change your mind. And mostly two now. And you know what, Tony? I'm not saying Shane Wright is not a good player. Okay. I don't see him as a Neil Yakupov or. You know, a dog Wickenheiser. No, I think he is a good player. I think it will be a good combo with Nick Suzuki at center. So fans can relax. The only thing is, it's not, it's not McDavid. It's not Matthews. Uh, it's that kind of year. And that's why 
have you noticed that Kent Hughes wasn't jumping up and down when, when he got the, you, you know, when he saw that he had the number one pick? It Usually almost the- sounds a stink. It almost sounds like your thought process in this. You correct me if I'm wrong. It's kind of like the thought process when when fantasy um, experts do hockey pools. When people do hockey pools and they're saying, you know what, a number one overall. There's a guy who's probably going to pick up 95 points. But at number six, I'm going to get 70 points. And then if I can get the 12th pick as well, I'm going to get 50 points. So I'm going to get two guys who are going to total 120. Instead of one guy at 95, I'm better off with that strategy. It's kind of like that, is it not? Is that like that? Yeah. Same idea. Whereas that's why they call you snake, because in a draft... It goes left to right, and then it comes back. It's a snake draft, you see? And a snake, yeah. But it, it's true. Whereas the year of McDavid, even if you had offered me two, three, four, five, and six, I would not have taken it. Now, yeah. let's backtrack for a second here. Yeah. The year the Canadians picked Kock and Yemi at three, who was your pick before the draft? Because I know you wrote about it. It's documented. Who did you Queen, take? Quinn Hughes. You took Quinn Hughes, who I think went seventh to Vancouver. Yeah. All right. The year they took Galchenyuk, third overall in 2012. Did you pronounce yourself on that one too? It, it is also documented. Philip Forsberg. Took some pretty good players there. In both draft years, you took better players than the Canadians took. I guess, yeah. I've made mistakes too. Which ones? Well, uh, you're going to laugh. But in, tw- in 2013, I had Nishushkin in front of McKinnon. Oh, my. But, look, I think you can see flashes of Nishushkin now, this year in Colorado, nine years later. What I saw in him, I thought he that was going to be a super power forward. He had a good 18-year-old season in Dallas. Then he got injured. He got into... Lind- Did you have Lind- Drouin before McKinnon? No, Drouin, uh, I never liked him. Why? Because he was, to me, he was just a dangler. And this is not the kind of game that I appreciate in the NHL. I want guys, you know, I, I want hardworking guys who are talented, but I, I don't like guys who look good in practice or at the outdoor skating rink. But when you get to an NHL game, and they're facing uh, Victor Hedman, they disappear. All right. So I understand your logic in saying you see value in the draft because you probably think the draft is a little bit deeper than most seem to think. Or you probably think it's deeper because the gap between the top and mid-rounds and mid-table is probably not that much. But let me ask you this. Who would be your number one? Let, let's get away from the value now at 6 and 12. Who would be your number one pick and why? Okay. If they don't make that deal that you're talking about. Okay. First of all, my number one pick is not a guy that I would choose number one every year. But again, this is that kind of draft. So he's not a good value pick either. But I prefer to Shane Wright. I prefer Connor Geeky because of the upside of this guy. Wow. I feel that right, what you see is what you get. Correct me if I'm wrong, but on most lists or the consensus is in no particular order is right, Cooley, Nemec, Juracek, Slavkowski, and Kemmel. Am I right? That's pretty much it, yeah. Savoy's in the top 10? Yeah, Geeky, I think, is uh, is going to be borderline top 10. Where's Lambert? Oh. Lambert, I wouldn't be surprised if he fell to the second round. Wow, really? Just, eh? like, just like Ati Ratu last year. Wow. To, uh, the, the Finnish guy who was supposed to be the number yeah. one pick, and he, he dropped to the second round. Brad Lambert, to me, is a no draft. If the Canadians want to draft a centerman, because they want to be fine at center for the next decade. They have Suzuki right now. They have Dvorak. They probably want to put someone between them. Or even if 
they put Dvorak at second line center for the next year. And then that player that they draft who's a center ends up becoming a second line centerman in a year from now or two years from now. Who's the center? Connor Geeky. Connor Geeky. Yeah. Perfect compliment to Nick Suzuki. Wow. The thing with Geeky is that he has fantastic hockey sense. He's strong along the boards. He, he has wonderful work ethic from what I was told. And he has better speed than people think. I saw this guy at least three times this year back check from his own zone and basically break a two-on-one on the other side. The only problem is his first couple of steps are not very good. Well, that and doesn't work well for the National Hockey League in 2023. Exactly. exactly. So some people have told me, this guy smells Logan Brown. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. But I don't think it's Logan Brown because I thought Logan Brown didn't have a good work ethic. So I, I, I don't put Geeky in that category. I'm not worried. But I, I, I would assume that power skating lessons are a must for this guy before he gets to the NHL just to improve his first few steps. If this guy improves his first few steps... He's going to be a monster, an absolute monster. He's almost six foot four. He's 200 pounds. He, he, he had a growth spurt in uh, between the age of 15 and 16. He was very, very thin when he was drafted because uh, you probably know that in the WHL, they draft Bantam players at age 14. So right now, he's just a young guy growing into a, a, a man's body. Speaking of size, one scout told me Tony, Shane Wright is not six foot tall. He could be listed at six feet or six one if they want. He's not. Okay. One scout told me that. Uh, I have a tendency to think that it's possible. I'm not going to say it's not possible. Just I to get back to uh, Geeky, yeah. For, yeah. because people like player comparisons. I, yeah. see, I see NG Kopitar. Wow. Yeah. That's a good player. Anzi Kopitar went 11 in the draft, but man, he was much better pick than 11th. Yeah. Stanley Cup champion. Yeah. All right. Okay. I, I'm curious. To, I'm curious to where Logan Cooley's um, going to go because he played with Kent Hughes' son. So you would think that Kent knows him like the back of his hand. Yeah. Does he like him or not? That's the question. And I honestly well, think that him at number one, it's going to be because he loves him and because he knows him really well. And if he doesn't and he picks Shane, Wright, It's because he knows enough of Cooley to think that he's not the best player in the draft. Yeah. And I think that Cooley, because of the fact that New Jersey is drafting second, if Wright goes number one, I don't think New Jersey is going to draft him because they already have Isher and Jack Hughes with our two, of course. Small, two small centermen. So I would think that New Jersey would go for either a Slavkovsky or a defenseman. Uh, I would I would think you're accurate in that. Yeah, that's my I, guess. Yeah. Would they even risk maybe even trading it with with another team that probably, you know, a, a team that probably has the fifth pick or the sixth pick or. Well, Tom Fitzgerald mentioned a few days maybe ago. Maybe New Jersey might make that pick with Columbus that you're talking about. Yeah. But remember what Tom Fitzgerald said a few days ago. He said he was willing to trade the pick, which at the time was number five for immediate help. So if he does trade the number two pick, I think he'll want a player that he that can play right away and obviously a high-quality player. Maybe not a superstar, but because it's not a, a fantastic draft, but maybe a, a 25-30 goal scorer who's already established and under contract. Because you know wow. how these GMs are. They start a rebuild, they start very well, and then at some point after a couple of years, either the, the owner or themselves become very impatient. Look, look, look at Ottawa, look at Vancouver. You know, they, they become impatient after a couple of years and then they proclaim that the rebuild is over and it's not. And then they, you know, they, they stay in the, the basement of the standings. You, uh, you kind of shocked me tonight here on the SICK podcast, but, uh, you know, uh, and, and I still think that the Montreal Canadiens will select Shane Wright to tell you the truth. Having said that, I want to talk to you about him. The year of no hockey during the pandemic, 
Is it possible that this kid is actually much better than what he's shown us, but he's playing catch up? I would say yes and no. I'll tell you why. Uh, when you start scouting a player at age 15, and by the way, I do agree with you. I think the Habs will select St. Shane Wright. So it's very relevant to talk about him for the next couple of months. Okay. Uh, I think this guy, you know, when you start scouting guys at age 15, 16, pre-draft year, you only see the their qualities, the good points. So if you see a game where the guy is spectacular, he makes a couple of spectacular plays, that's what you focus on. You don't focus on uh, the things to improve or stuff you don't like because you're thinking, okay, he's just 15, he's just 16. Shane Wright at 15. That's that's my school of thought, eh? By the way, and I'm not a scout by all means, but if I can, one of the things I've always, uh, I always do when looking at players is I don't focus on their weaknesses and on their faults because everyone has them. But what I do focus on is the great games and the great performances. Because if I see those and I start thinking, I don't think another player can do what that player just did. That's when I rate that player very high. Listen, I don't even know if that's a good school of thought or not, but that's usually the way I look at it. Look, it's not bad, but it depends on how often the guy does it and what circumstances. And again, if that can, if it's, if it's feasible in the NHL again. So Shane Wright at age 15, he was impressive. Uh, He had good line mates. But he was impressive. I liked him. And I was curious to see how things would evolve for this guy at 16 and 17. I wasn't ready to proclaim him the next McDavid because I thought McDavid at 15 was better than Shane Wright. Problem at 16 is that the OHL didn't play. So we had a very, very small sample at the under-18 tournament where Wright was very good, but I would say not great. But look, he didn't play all year. But this year, he had a very slow start. And I blamed it on the fact that he didn't play. But there are other players in the Ontario Hockey League who didn't play. And they did very well. If you think of the the leading scorer, Wyatt Johnston, he was drafted by Dallas in the first round last year. A lot of people were wondering, oh, yeah, Wyatt Johnston? Well, maybe they found a gem. And this is going to happen. The COVID year will probably, so draft 2021, we'll see some gems come out of this draft will, uh, who will be seen as steals because the Ontario League didn't play. Uh-huh. So getting back to right, uh, I, I think he, his game started picking up after Christmas. I do think he was better in the second half. In the playoffs so far, I've watched every game. Because I subscribe to a website where they break down all his shifts. So you can watch Shane Wright's game in 20 minutes, let's say. Very, very practical. So you yeah. can watch a bunch of games in one evening. So I watch all these games. I I, I, I think he's good. I think he's more involved. What, what's it called again? Is that the ring net? No, it's uh, Instat Scout. Instat Scout, yeah, yeah, they have, it, yeah, they, they use the same one in soccer too. Instat, yeah, exactly. They use yeah. my scout and Instat, yeah. Okay, go ahead. So, um, right in the playoffs, I think is more involved. Uh, he plays on the PK, does a good job. Uh, he, he gets a point per game, but he's not dominant. And what you want to see from the number one overall pick is a dominant player in junior hockey. I don't see a dominant player. I, I, I don't see a guy who makes tons of plays. I don't see a guy who necessarily makes his line mates better. I just see a very good hockey player. You're depressing me. I called you to cheer me up. You're depressing me. Yeah, but I'm telling you, he's a, he's a very good hockey player. I understand that, but I, I don't want very good. He's I not want a very- franchise player. And I don't think nobody around the NHL thinks he's a franchise player. But you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. He's not because, Tony Marinero, who's a 50-goal scorer at what he does. Of course not. Of course not. My God. No, no, but look, the, the thing yes. is, think of the I'll GMs, okay? Time. Yeah. Right now, they're thinking, 
okay, we don't think Shane Wright is going to be a star or a superstar, let's say. But who else? So you're kind of taking a chance. Me, I'm just telling you, Connor Geeky. But you know what? I don't work for an NHL team. My job is not on the line. But you I offered your care. services to the Canadians? Yes, I did. Who did you speak to? Oh, I just I, I just offered my services uh, through the media. Through the media? Yeah. That's, that's it. All I, that's all I can say. Okay. There was an article on TV Aspar a couple of days ago about it. Okay. Somebody and went to bat for you, though. Eh? Who went to bat for you? I can't say. Oh, okay. But, uh, pardon me? Not even to me. Not even to you. You had a member of the media reach out to Kent Hughes? I, I, I don't know. To be honest oh. with you, okay. I, 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 I don't even know because I didn't say anything. The journalists learned something. Maybe there's two people who recommended me. Uh, and uh, so I, I honestly, th there are some things that are not clear. So that's why I can't tell you anything because it's not even clear in my head what happened. Okay. But anyway, getting back to right. You would want to work for them to cover the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. No, no. I would like no? to work uh, in, a, in a consultant role just like Vinil Cavalier does. Okay. Because to be honest with you, go going to arenas and fill out these scouting reports uh, nine on ten for skating, seven on ten for uh, uh, the shot, blah blah blah. To me, it's it's passe. Yeah, me, I, 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 me, me. I, I I want to be consulted on various decisions. Let's say trade deadline. What do you think of that player? This team is offering that player. I give my two cents. They do whatever. Like they for want example, with. when they traded Pacioretty to Vegas, and they were looking for Cody Glass, and Vegas offered up Nick Suzuki, and then. They turned to Trevor Timmons and his staff, yeah. and they got a scouting report on Nick Suzuki, and they said to Mark Bergevin, go for it. Yeah, and like and they said, it. when the, the, the Habs made the trade for Tyler to Foley, uh, Kent Hughes consulted Vinil Cavalier about uh, Heinemann, the guy they got for Laval. Yes. So that's the kind of job that I would like, because that's that's what I do right now for the Farrar, you know? I got they ask you. me about this player, I, I, that player, yeah. I have to ask you. It's already done, and it was done when Mark Bergevin was relieved of his duties. So was Trevor Timmons. Would you have relieved Trevor Timmons of his duties, yes or no, and why? Oh, I would have relieved Trevor Timmons of his duties 10 years ago. Whoa. And I mentioned it a lot on Twitter, and I got, and, and, and I got a lot of heat for it. But I what do you say to those who say that, okay, he probably doesn't hit that many home runs, but he hits a lot of singles, and a lot of players end up playing in the National Hockey League? Who cares? You, 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 you need stars. You, you, you need impact players. Who cares if he gets Jake Evans? Jake Evans, I can get on July 1st for $700,000. He started out well, I have to say, 2003, 2005. Although well, he made a mistake. 2003 with wasn't good. It was Kostitsin's year. No, but he got other players further. Uh, 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 well, yeah, the but took, yeah, no, but in 2003, they took Corey Urquhart at number 40. Yeah, he, I he know. Measured off 45. I know, but the, the first, and 2007 was absolutely spectacular. 2007 was spectacular. Ryan yeah, but then, Max Pacioretty, P.K. Subban. Yeah, but then he, he sort of surfed on 2007. Because remember, it takes 10 years to be able to judge a chief scout. Because the first five years, you have to wait until these players develop. And then you, you need about five years of drafting to be able to judge a guy. So basically, you need 10 years to judge him. Five drafts, five years to develop. So it takes at least, I would say, between seven and 10 years, you're starting to see. So Trevor Timmons, at some point, around 2012, when Bergevin was hired, his biggest mistake was to keep Trevor Timmons. I don't know what Trevor Timmons told him because usually when a GM is hired, he fires the chief scout. That's what happens. That's what happened in uh, you know, Minnesota when Bill Guerin took over. That's what happened in Philadelphia when Fletcher took over. They fire chief scouts. Not necessarily because they're not good, but because they have another, they have their You bring in your own people. You bring in your own people. But I don't know what well, he obviously meant. kept him because he thought he was doing a good job. Or what did Timmons tell him? You know, Trevor Timmons kept saying 
that, oh, in 2008, if they hadn't traded the pick for Tanguay, he would have chosen John Carlson. Well, if you go on the internet and you look at an article that was on um, uh, a website, a hockey website at the time, there was an interview with Trevor Timmons. And he said, oh, uh, it's too bad we didn't have the first pick because we were looking for a forward, uh, a guy from the queue, and but uh, then he was picked in the second round, too bad. That's not John Carson. Speaking of a guy from the queue, last year in the fifth round, the Canadians selected... Trevor Timmons selected Joshua Roy, who led the queue in scoring, and he's doing real well in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League playoffs. Obviously, you've scouted in the queue. You're a consultant for Le Ferrar de Valdar, like you said. You must know this player very well. Can this player be even 75% of the player that he is this year at the National Hockey League level? Because that would be a home run. That would be a gem. Okay, he, he, this guy is a very interesting case. Because at age 15, he was the top midget player in Quebec. And he was perceived as probably a top five pick in 2021. I'm talking three years ago. Then a 16-year-old season didn't go very well in St. John. 17-year-old season didn't go very well until he was traded at the deadline to Sherbrooke. Mm -hmm. And then he took off. Yeah. But I think he took off a little bit too late. So that's why he was available in the fifth round. I thought he was going to go probably late second, early third. Now, I watch him this year. Obviously, he's very productive. But I worry about his pace of play. This is a guy who does everything pretty slowly. The NHL, you're watching the playoffs just like anybody else right now. It's a fast game. It's a quick game. The read and react has to be like that because the, the gaps close in a hurry. Exactly. And Joshua Roy right now, he has extra time to do what he needs to do to score. And he does it well. But, but really smart players can yes, make time and space for themselves. I agree because there's always two schools of thought. You can always say that the guy slows down the play, you know, a la Correct. Nick Suzuki. But you can also say that the guy lacks pace, lacks pace in his play. I got you. So if you don't like the guy, you're going to say he lacks pace. If you like the guy, you're going to say he slows down the play and he's good at it. Right now with Joshua Roy, I'm sort of in the middle right now. I'm trying to figure out if his style is going to be effective or not. Remember, he had a pretty good training camp in Montreal. I know it doesn't mean anything because it's just September, but he had a good training camp. So now, do I think he's going to be a top six player in the NHL right now and a productive one? I can't. I, I, I can't say. I can't say yes. I can't say no right now. Simon Boisvert tells you that if you're a betting man or betting woman, Betway, for the love of the game, sign up and deposit on Betway for a 100% deposit bonus, the easiest sports book for all Canadians. E-transfers are accepted like immediately and instantaneously. He tells you the Montreal Canadiens will draft Shane Wright. He tells you he would draft Connor Geeky. He also says if Columbus calls the Canadians and say, I'll trade you pick six and pick 12, you give me pick number one, he would call NHL Central Registry right away. I, this has been a riveting conversation for me. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have Three or fun. four speed questions for you. Okay. All right? Not counting anyone who's on the team who's played a significant role. So I'm not counting Suzuki. I'm not talking counting Caulfield here. Who's the best prospect in the Montreal Canadiens organization going forward? Hmm. Or right now, who's the best prospect in the Canadiens organization? Without, well, it's going to be Shane Wright. Uh, but uh, otherwise, look, one of the defensemen, maybe, maybe Justin Barron. But the most talented, I would say Sean Farrell. Most talented. But then again, there's always always that doubt whether it translates to the National Hockey Yeah, League. and he and he plays at Harvard, which is not... Uh, he's already 21. He's playing at Harvard. He needs to get to Laval, ASAP. So I would say most talented, Sean Farrell. But top prospect is between Barron and Gooley. But uh, we're not talking a, a top two defenseman here. Once upon a time, a member of the Canadians organization told me that Logan Mayu reminded them somewhat 
of Shea Weber. How do you see Logan Mayu? I see Logan Mayu right now as a very unfinished product. I think right now he has a tendency to uh, uh, dominate at times because of his physique. Uh, he's all over the ice. He's not very disciplined in terms of, you know, playing his position very well on defense. Uh, look, he, he needs to mature. And I mean on the ice. I don't mean off the ice. I mean on the ice, he needs to mature. He's going to need another year of junior hockey. He's going to need time in Laval. We'll see then. But for now, I see him as a possible NHLer. But Shea Weber, that's, uh, yeah, that's quite a comparison. Mayu, Baron, Harris, Gooley, Norlinder. Of the five, who will one day best be able to quarterback the Canadians' power play? None of them. And Norlinder, by the way, I've been on record saying this is not an NHLer. He's a ballet dancer. He should go back to Sweden. Caden Primo, will he make a number one in the National Hockey League, yes or no? No. Not, even sure. Not even sure. Wow. Snake, this has been fun. A lot of fun. Thanks for doing this. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Thank you. It was a pleasure, Tony. Simon Snake Boisvert. What a podcast. This podcast is sick. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, Intense by Nature, and Lakage. If the last time you went to Lakage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Lakage. The menu will surprise you.